Uh, welcome everyone. I'm Alicia with Chariot Solutions, and I'm here to introduce Jeepa Hill, presenting "Failing at Change: How to Try Different, How to Try Different, and Not Harder When Things Don't Add Up." Uh, take it away, Jeepa. And just a heads up: I do not see your slides. Right. Good. That's Perfect. Good. That's on purpose. Right, For the take moment, it away. you get to see my big head. Hi everybody, welcome. Uh, uh, thanks for having me. Thanks for coming here, and and thanks to the team at ETE for for uh, setting me up with this talk. Very excited. A um, couple of words of introduction. My name is G Paw Hill. I know that's an unusual name, G E E P A W. What it is is that I know I look like a grandfather now, but I actually became a grandfather. My wife's a little older than me, and she had kids who were almost adults at the time we got together. So I actually became a grandfather when I was just 31 years old. And my friends and family, because you know how friends and family are, they thought that was hilariously funny. And they called me grandfather this and grandfather that. And grandfather got shortened to grandpa and then to g -paw. So even though, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a big g -paw now and a g -paw looking dude, I got that name 30 years ago. 30, yeah, wow. 30 years ago, and uh, and it's stuck. So the name is G-Paw. Uh, the name of my talk is, this doesn't add up. Notice the funky spelling of add. And it's about failing at change and trying something a little bit different. Um, I'm gonna, uh, the, the talk is divided into two parts. And in the first part, I, I talk about two sort of uh, triplets of ideas that people bring to our trade when they when they talk about changing uh, changing systems, changing the code, what we do for a living, change code, and uh, and they're kind of negative, but I've got an alternative, and I'm going to really talk to you about the alternative. Um, this is a, an emerging technology conference, and. And my alternative, it's not a technology, but my, uh, my alternative approach is really an emerging one also. So that's why it felt like this was a, a good fit for me to, uh, uh, to show up and, and talk to you today about this. So we'll start with this first trio of ideas that we bring uh, to the table pretty much automatically when we start thinking about making changes to our systems. The first one is, <clears throat> Excuse me. The first one is the finish line. We get this idea that there is a finish line. It's an ending of sorts. And we know right where it is and nothing else matters. Nothing matters before the finish line and nothing matters after the finish line. And if you go back and you read in software development and design theory uh, back in the 80s and early 90s, you'll find that that the process that they generally recommend is centered completely around the idea of a finish line. Um, their process amounts to three steps. Uh, step one, nothing. Step two, everything. Step three, move on. And, and that's sort of the whole thing. Every example that you see, and to be honest, most of those examples are, are as bad and empty as the modern to-do list examples that we see over and over again. You got nothing, then you got everything, then we'll start another project. And that's sort of the concept uh, that, that is there in the finish line. After the finish line, the next thing we say to ourselves as well, if we've got a finish line, we're gonna be super efficient and we're gonna move towards our, our finish line on a perfectly straight path. It's the shortest distance between here where we are now and there, the finish line where we wanna be. Two points, one line, perfect efficiency. Now, what that means in turn, we don't necessarily always call this one out, but it's there. The, the third part of this little trilogy is this one. We never step off that line, and we certainly never step backwards. And so in order to do this, what we do is we take uh, our change and we break it into, uh, we imagine, envision a solution. In fact, and sometimes I call that solution the city on the hill. And the city on the hill, this faraway place, um, has all these pieces in it, and each piece is finished. And when we say no steps off the line and never step backwards, what we mean is that 
every step we take creates one of the finished parts. And the next step we take creates another one. And at the end, what we wind up with is the city on the hill. So we say that the steps have to lie on that straight line to finishedness. And we never make a mistake. No. And we never take a, a step, we never change the same thing twice because each step is just that one uh, part of, uh, of our actual city on the hill. So it looks kind of like this. With small scale change, the theory and the practice looks like this. We invest a certain amount of value, right? We invest value of some kind because none of this is free, right? This is not a free lunch world. We have to gather up some value so that we can then invest it. And we do that. And what we do is we determine our target and then we identify what those final parts are gonna be. And let's say, as in this picture, there are four of them. And we change the first part to final. And then we change the second part to its final. And then we change the third part and then the fourth part. And that's how we go from before to after. And of course, when we get to after, we're going to get perfect value from all of that. Now, there's nothing wrong with this trilogy. In fact, of the six bad ideas that I'm gonna show you, not one of them is really bad. In fact, they're all excellent ideas with plenty of perfectly useful applications out in the world, except for one of them. I'll call that one out when we get to it, which is just bad all around. Um, but this simple small scale change model where theory and practice line up extremely well is only useful in contexts where it really is a small scale change. As soon as we get to any sort of target that's any further away, and, and how far away would it mean? If we're talking about code, I'm talking about a target that's bigger than eh, a day and a half. If I'm talking about uh, a story, I'm talking about a target that's bigger than a week. That constitutes far, far away. And the individual steps, again, if I'm talking about code, my own steps, meh, I try to make them somewhere between 15 minutes and an hour for those individual steps. Actually, I wanted to call something out to you all back on that previous slide. Notice that these blue steps here, the, the blue steps have different lengths. That's actually important because when we're following that initial trilogy, it's fine that there are different lengths. So that second step there in the middle, that might be 15 minutes. Then occasionally I blow past things and on that third step, it's an hour and a half or two hours. And then the fourth step is back to my usual size and so on and so forth. So that's an important call out that I forgot to make. So anyway, all these ideas work fine. There's no harm with them, really there isn't, provided only that the finish line is right near us. And the problem is no modern application really is right near us. That's not how modern applications work. That, that whole process of nothing, everything, move on, you know what? That's not really very realistic because that's not really what we do in the trade nowadays. The sorts of projects that we take on are much further away than a week, or if you're coding, than a day. They're much, much further away. So we have to come up with mm, another layer. Uh, 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 another, another source of, uh, of how are we going to strategize about this? And now we get to the second trilogy of ideas. The first part of it is the multi-track theory. What we're going to do is paralyze, parallelize our development. And the assumptions that go into understanding this, this parallel development are that the parallelism itself is free, controlling the different tracks is free. Information that we use to monitor those tracks is free. And managing moving trains from track to track is all free. And that's the idea of the multi-track rig. And as soon as you see that, you know what I'm talking about. My guess is that most of you routinely encounter uh, application situations in which that first simple model isn't good enough, isn't fast enough. And so we implement a multi-track rig. 
Some of you work in safe organizations where, in fact, the multi-track rigid is built in from the very beginning. In fact, those sorts of organizations see software development as something that can be treated like a machine, the process machine. Uh, it has these parts, humans, it has procedures, it has computers, they're all arranged in a beautiful flow graph. JIRA will even show you the flow graph for the states that you have available to you in your stories. And what we'll do is we'll come up with a bunch of completely unambiguous rules that will make this all fit together and we will build ourselves a better machine. And, and that idea is the next idea that may or may not work at scale and it's called the process machine. Of course, these last two really only came up because of the scale. We don't need a process machine when we're working at small scale and we don't need parallelism when we're working at small scale. We only need those or feel we do when we go to a larger scale. Now I have one more in the second trilogy, I have one more idea. And this is the only one of these ideas that is pretty much uniformly a bad idea. The other five, the whole first trilogy and these last two that we've looked at, it depends on your context. It depends on what you're up to, whether or not these are good ways to think about changing code. I would argue that in our modern context, they're not terribly good ideas. But nevertheless, there are plenty of contexts, linear physical world situations, manufacturing even. There are plenty of contexts in which these five make sense, but there's no real good context where this one makes sense. And, and that one is the human part, right? If we have a, a process machine, it, it involves procedures and computers and humans. Wait, did I just put a human into a machine? Did I just turn a human into a machine part? Well, then I have adopted the concept of the human part. And that says that, that humans are, I use a fancy word, fungible. Uh, coal is fungible, fungible. If you have a kilo of coal and another kilo of coal, you can't tell the difference between them without a whole lot of effort. I can easily, if I need two kilos over here on my left hand, I can easily take this one and put it with that one and everything goes great. Why? Because they're fungible. The human part is based around an idea that humans are fungible, that we can interchange them, that they work just like coal. They work whether, whether, they don't care what we use them for. They don't get bored or tired or distracted. They will do anything you want. So these two trilogies add up to something that looks kind of like this in theory. It's a large scale change. We start same as we did before by pulling together some value that has to be invested. Although notice, because this is a large scale change, that has to be quite a bit of value, quite a bit of value invested for quite a bit of value received. And hopefully, of course, the two are in alignment or the value received is even larger. That's always the sort of operative model in all of these. Then we determine the target, just like we did in the simple steps, except it's harder because the target, it's harder because the value invested is so much larger, right? What happens is, the stakes go up. They go up a lot because setting up a system that looks like this enormous flow in front of you is an expensive proposition. And when the stakes get high like that, people get tense. They cannot afford to make mistakes. So then we do the same thing again that we, that we did in the first uh, uh, simplest case. We identify the final parts. But again, the stakes are extremely high because of the large size. And that extreme intensity of stakes is, is very expensive for us because it means we have to be so careful, so thoughtful, so political, so clever. But even then we haven't even met the extent of the cleverness that is required because now I'm gonna create three parallel streams and I'm gonna create final parts 
in blue steps, just like we did before, on every one of those streams. Notice that the size factor here means that I'm creating for myself a synchronization problem. Until I assemble the final parts, I will not know how things are going until we get there. The only way I could fix that would be if I were to draw more vertical lines here and constrain the steps. And of course, when I do that, once again, I'm caught back up in politics land. I'm caught back up in something we call long pole politics. I don't know if you've ever experienced that. You probably have, but long pole politics is, well, at least it wasn't my fault. So if we drew a sync line, I can't draw one on the screen right now, but if we drew a sync line in between this end point and this end point, what you would see is that these guys on top finished first. These guys in the middle went over. And these guys, we can't even fit them into this. They would have an enormous long wait if we waited to start their second final part until we had hit that sync point. So that's what I mean when I say that, that uh, um, the size of those really matters in a, in a big way. So we're prevented from doing our assembly until the very end. And curiously, that moment where we find out that it does not work is actually precisely the moment at which we either will or won't receive the value for our huge investment. So naturally, that is a very scary, tense, high pressure moment. And it would be a tense, high pressure moment even if we had some degree of confidence that the final parts were actually gonna work together. Although frankly, Typically, we usually don't. So the large scale change in theory looks beautiful like this. In practice, the high investment creates high stakes. High stakes means we can't ever screw up. We have to win. We have to stay on top. We have to be right. And that means we have to argue through things. It means we have to think of everything. Then we have the parallelism, which creates weight states and sink errors unless we ignore weight states, in which case we're not gonna know anything until the very end. A third thing that I haven't mentioned, remember those human parts? Two aspects really to it. The first one is that a big bang benefit out there at the end is a lousy motivator for human beings. So our human parts, they don't perform very well. They don't perform very well just based on the fact that the motivation is too far away. Furthermore, I don't know if you noticed, but humans don't actually like human parts. So they don't go the extra mile. They don't give up their heart and their soul to become a machine part and a process machine. And we wind up failing. We wind up failing in our changes a lot as a result of this. So what do we do? What do we do normally in the trade when we fail with one of these great big large scale changes? Well, we try harder. We regard such failures as failures of our will. My gosh, I was so weak to not have remembered to do this. I was so weak to not have considered that angle. I was so weak to have relied on folks who are not able to assemble things in the correct way. We need more discipline. We have to try harder people. And then in addition to the layer of encouraging us to be more motivated and to, to work that much harder next time, we almost always add more rules. Each rule is very simple, honestly. And if you just remember these 371 simple rules, well, you can't go wrong, really, can you? It'll be just fine. Our large scale change that just failed. The next time we do a large scale change using all six of, of those bad ideas, bad ideas in context, well, five bad ideas in context and one bad idea pretty much universally. Combining all six of those together, we will do it again. And this time, because we try harder, it will work. 
That's the bad news. That's the bad take. And that's the nastiness and mean-spirited part of my talk. This doesn't work. And it doesn't just not work a little. It, it doesn't work a lot. So what I propose, my emergent approach that I'm out there pitching all the time to people, what I propose is that we try different, not holy. Listen, I'm okay. I'm okay if you take three swings as hard as you can and it doesn't work. I'm not okay taking the fourth one. Instead, I want to try something different. So I'm going to try to give you some positive advice and I'm going to stretch it out a little bit. Um, uh, I rushed through that first part because this talk is notoriously overtime because I am a notoriously overtime talker. Three pieces of advice I'm going to give to describe, to start sketching in this new approach. First, take many more, much smaller steps, each one of which is independently shippable. We'll talk about that in a minute. Second, use experiences to change behavior, not rules. Third, work on the easiest, nearest problems before you work on the hardest, furthest ones. Now, you'll notice that every one of these is essentially at the very least altering and very often abandoning most of that sextet of ideas that we started with. That's not a coincidence. I've been a geek for 40 years. I learned how to do this by giving up on doing it the way those six principles tell us to do it. So try different, not harder. Let's look at it a little bit closer. All of this, what is actually emerging is something that we call the change harvesting approach. The change harvesting approach, and I could do a whole talk just about these five things, but it starts from five basic understandings about how we should be approaching the changes that we need to make. The first thing is that we want to take advantage of the humanness. We want to work with all the features of our system that involve humans and not against them. Why? Well, because in a system, a tripartite system, a three-part system that has humans, procedures, and machines, the most powerful part by far is the humans. If you don't believe me, have you ever heard about uh, a kind of strike, a kind of managerial labor strike called uh, uh, work to rule. In a work to rule strike, all the workers come in on time. They all follow the procedure exactly the way it was written down to them, without fail. Such strikes are incredibly successful because the productivity plummets when you work to rule. Why? Because the procedures were not the thing that kept that system flowing. The humans were the thing that kept it, uh, kept it flowing. All right, what about local? Local just means this. That's the part where we talk about the small scale of the change. We want each change to be quite local in, in its effect. We do not want global sweeping changes. I think of terms of locality as being about normalness and about maintaining, hang on just a second, ah, there we go, and about, uh, about neighborhood. Localness is about neighborhood. It is about the idea that we are going to um, keep everything that we do, each step of it, well within our reach, our mental reach, our physical reach, our relationship reach. That's local. That makes you wonder, of course, then how are you ever going to get to a faraway place? And the answer to that is the next term, oriented. It's as simple as this. Instead of staying on that line of always and only developing single uh, finished parts, instead, we take steps. And at each step, we just look at where we're at, turn ourselves towards the far target to remember where it is, and take another step. Another, the other step doesn't have to be a step on that straight line. 
We just have to be aware of what that target is. And that's orient. Next up we have here, here's a funny word. When people plan large scale change, when, when they, they go off to the moon or something like that, what they normally do is they start at the moon and they think their way backward. That's how they develop those ideas. But what the change harvester says is no, start here, start where we are right now and go forward. Forward thinking instead of work your way back and then go forward thinking. Start from here every time. So that means that if you're coding, the first place you start is understanding the code you already have. Remember, there are no finish lines, very few of them in, in the trade these days. So as a result, we always have code that's already there. If you have code that's already there, start from that code and move it forward. Don't start at the end point and try to go reason your way backwards. That's here. Finally, and by far most importantly, iterative. Okay, I said most important. I don't think that's really true. Humans most important. But next up is iterative. What does that mean? It means that we assume that we are going to take each step knowing full well that we may again change the same thing that that step changed previously. Even if we don't do it in steps one and two, we might do it in step one and then in step four, we might touch the same thing. So we don't decompose our problem into only finished parts, only final parts. Instead, the iterative approach says, we're just gonna keep changing stuff until we get what we want. And we don't care from an efficiency point of view. I'm serious, we do not care whether that change involves us changing the same part of our system two times. It's the reverse. The iterative approach is the reverse of the straight line, shortest distance approach. So what's this look like? I mean, I showed you the diagrams for the other two. What's this one look like? Well, the first thing you notice is it doesn't go in a very straight line. I wish I had driven. I mean, I, re I wish I had drawn on this slide another dotted white line to show you that we're wandering off and around the line quite a bit. But orientation actually is what's keeping us close enough to the line that we're working. A next oddity about this, notice that the size of these steps is very important. It's the size of these steps, in fact, that is the first limit that decides what step should I take next. I don't take any step that is bigger than my maximum size ever. That is, in fact, the pressure that forces us off that straight white line. It is the desire to keep those steps of a suitable size. Now, I've drawn my little circle of cost and benefit and value and everything differently. Um, each one of these steps has a smaller cost. It has a smaller benefit. Some of that benefit, some of these steps, I should have drawn them differently as well. Some of those steps, you know, the benefit is really not, if you think in terms of code, this code will not benefit the customer today. That is to say, there is no great payoff for this step extrinsically. But what this is doing, and it's working with humanness and localness, what it's doing is it's reaping the intrinsic value of taking steps. That intrinsic value is actually quite significant. We'll talk about it, I think, right now. First piece of advice, take many more, much smaller steps. And how do I define step? A step is in code. A step is shippable. I don't care whether you actually ship it or not. What I care is if you had the magic button that says ship this, every time at the end of every single step, you should feel perfectly comfortable pressing that button. So that's what I mean when I say step. What's this give us? Well, obviously it gave us the lower investment and of course the corresponding lower benefit. But let's talk about three intrinsic values 
that those initial pictures where we made the steps as big as we wanted them to be, don't have. First of all, they give us rhythmic reward. I know that most of you have used test-driven development, or at least many of you in one thing. And one of the reasons TDD works so well is because of the constant feedback, the constant rhythmic reward for success. Because you know what? We are humans and we like that. We are not very good at long-term gratification. We are very good at managing periods of tension punctuated by periods of release. And that's what I mean when I say the rhythmic reward. Additionally, because the steps are so small, our mental bandwidth is greatly reduced. That is a huge benefit to us because the limits on human bandwidth are far, far more rigorous and profound than what most people think that they are. What are those limits? 1954, a guy named Gordon Miller, um, uh, wrote a paper who posited that the, the human mental bandwidth was somewhere, it was seven plus or minus two, uh, somewhere between five items and nine items in his definition of human man bandwidth. And that that range of, of those four guys, uh, four values, <coughs> covered all humans everywhere. Well, it was a pretty radical thing to say, and it's been tested since then a thousand thousand times in a thousand thousand different ways and do you know what their conclusion was the modern consensus miller was totally wrong totally wrong that number's too big it should be five plus or minus one what miller was not accounting for was our incredible gift for making relationships that are arbitrary and not represented in reality and once we adjust for that, the numbers just hone in on this value, four to six. Four to six things at a time that you can, balls that a human can juggle in their mental hair, in the mental air, okay? So reducing mental bandwidth is in fact a huge intrinsic value to smaller steps. The last thing, interruptibility and steerable. Um, we, I know we, uh, so many of us have been at home working COVID during this time. And, and of course, when you're at home, one of the differences between home life and office life is that the home goes on around you and it interrupts you constantly. When you are holding nine things in the air at one time and your three-year-old wants a drink of water, you will wish you had been in a much more interruptible state. But, but it isn't just for us, right? It isn't just for us as individuals. It's also because each step at the end is shippable. That means I can always steer the direction of my project. If I'm a manager, steerability is critical for me. A casual example, uh, marketing comes to us and says, you know, we could close a guy, we, we could close a guy for $300 million if you could only finish this piece by July. We better be able to steer. We can't solve that problem if we're on the straight line trajectory with non-shippable steps. If we are on the crooked line that has the shippable steps, no problem, no problem. We can do that. So take many more, much smaller steps is such powerful advice that in fact i use it as what i call rice and garlic advice i had a friend at the beginning of COVID who's a professional chef and after about three months of isolation she said that she was going to finally give the grand summary of everything she had learned in 35 years of being a professional chef and this was on twitter and she followed with a single tweet and the single tweet had two rules in it one that's too much rice. And two, that's not enough garlic. That was it. That was the sum total of her knowledge. That was knowledge given blind, without any idea, of course, of, of who the reader was or what level of cooking, the skill that they had. But in fact, to people coming to cooking for the first time, 
That's actually really good advice. So my rice and garlic advice is this one. Take many more, much smaller steps. We get lower investment, we get rhythmic reward, reduced mental bandwidth, interruptibility and steerability. It's a huge value. And it's very different than how things work in the other two models that we've considered, the small scale and the large scale model. Next one, use experiences to change behavior instead of rules. Uh, focus on creating experiments and trying them. Scout ahead, prepare your experiment. Go ahead and do the research. Ask yourself as the experiment proceeds, how does it feel when it's working? Because remember the humans and remember the localness? Put those two together to make experiments. When it feels good, people do it. So how it feels is extremely important. And you can't generalize from theory about how it's going to feel when you do it. But how it's going to feel is actually going to determine whether your change is actually going to work or not when you make it. I tell people, avoid using numbers for this purpose until you have confidence already. A, a number is useless to me if it tells me to tell people to do things that are not gonna feel good to them. It won't help me because me telling them to do that isn't very effective. If I can get them to experiment and try a thing that they like, if I can get us in code to try and experiment and see whether we like it or not, then I win. If we do like it, I got fans for life of that particular technique. I don't have to tell them to do it. I don't have to order them to do it. They'll do it because they like doing it. They like how it makes them feel. So use experiences to change the behavior of your, of your teams and organizations and your code, not just theory, 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 think, 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 think. Last one. Fix the little problems. Go after those little problems. Go after them ferociously. Um, we see this in code all the time. When you do a refactoring, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna say refactoring. I'm gonna go ahead and define refactoring. I know most of you will already know for sure what it means, but unfortunately the term has been watered down. Refactoring your code means changing the text of your code without changing its measured behavior, okay? It does not mean rewriting. It means specifically changing the code, changing the design, changing the text without changing what it does. When we refactor, one of the things when I teach refactoring, I work with teams all over the world, they always want to refactor the great big problem out of existence. That's admirable, it's lovely, it's delightful, it's ineffective. Why? Because it's almost always out of your reach. It's too far away. It's too big. You would have to change too many things. Instead, look around your team and say, what's the easiest, nearest owie? Owie's an Americanism. What's the easiest, nearest pain in your world? Go fix that. Fix all of them. And when you're done fixing the first round of them, you'll see the second round of them. Fix all of them too. Fix the easiest, nearest alleys first. Now, what happens when you do this is we're not really, I use this, uh, this example, clear the brush before you, 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 you clear the trees. That's just a mental reminder. But the reality is problems that we work on as change agents are not in the physical world. In fact, if you clear the brush before the trees, the trees don't get closer to you and they don't get small. But if you clear the brush before the trees in your code, the trees get nearer to you and they get smaller. It creates the possibility of you actually being able to fix harder, further away out. It also builds the habit of change and the habit of winning at change. It also creates circles of trust. 
what you have to do is set aside that fairly simple idea that everything we do has a perfect mapping into the, into the physical world. The problems we work on, like I say, they're not 3D and, and they're not in the physical world. And they are abstract and they do not behave the same way things in the physical world do. I know it sounds counterintuitive. Always start by fixing the easiest, nearest tower before you move on to the ones that are further away or harder. So here we are, change harvesting, right? Human, local, oriented, here, iterative. But you notice that I didn't call this code change harvesting. What kind of changes are we talking about here? We could change our code ourselves. We could change the process we use, our team, our organization. We could make dramatic and impressive changes in the trade. And most importantly of all, we could change the world. I would ask you not to just not just to think outside the box created by those six. Uh, presumptive beliefs about the best way to approach team. I'd ask you also to think outside the model. Look around you in the world. All three of these pieces of advice that I applied to changing code just now actually apply rather well to changing anything. Take many more, much smaller steps. Create experiences, not arguments. And fix the easiest, nearest alley first. Finally, my closing thought, uh, you might wonder to yourself, is change even possible? <laughs> you would not believe, I looked at so many vintage ads in order to, to build this fairly weak set of slides. And I have to tell you, 75% of them, you guys would kick me out of here if I put that slide on a screen. Even though it was a commonplace ad, not, not 100 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, 50 years ago. Now, this one I'm about to show you, it, it's not actually offensive in that standard way, but I still had to blur part of the image. Why? Because change happens. This is a real ad, and I fell in love with this ad 40 years ago. Uh, it, was in, it was a two-page spread in Byte Magazine for Logitech mice. And what you got here is you got a kid in a diaper and it feels good. And then you got a kid <laughs> peeing up into space. I blurred it. It was not blurred in the original. It's not blocked out with a gray box in the original. And the logo, the logo feels better. It was a, really a pretty impressive ad campaign at the time. It really was. Um, I know that, that times have changed. I know that change really happens precisely because I can't show you the unexpurgated version of this ad or any version of the many ads that I already looked at. So you got to trust me. We can change things. We can make the world a better place. We have to get away from the idea that those six premises are particularly important or fundamental or required of us to change the code, ourselves, the team, the process, the organization, or the world. They're not, they're not needed. We can do better. We should do better. I'm trying to do better. Let's make the world better. Thanks very much for having me. Uh, we got a little bit of time left. If there are some questions that showed up in the Slack or anybody wants to ask questions, please feel free and we will uh, we'll use up the remainder of our time. Thank Thanks. you. Uh, and I'm not seeing questions in Slack or chat just yet. Um, I'll give people a few minutes if they want to ask anything. I got a couple in the Slack, it looks like. Oh, these are, uh, the Slack is uh, uh -huh. 
I not the slip in- of doom. I mean, yeah. All right. Uh, let me get my uh, let me get my big ugly face up on the screen. Here. We do have a uh, a question in Zoom that was um, big bang benefits of putting a man on the moon. So, um, so I got I got two responses to that. And first of all, I sh- I should make it clear. I-, I don't know if you guys have noticed this. You've been paying attention. We flew a helicopter on Mars. How insanely cool is that? That's insanely cool. I'm a huge fan of NASA's many extraordinary efforts to assemble large pe- groups of people together. Um, so I don't want to disrespect those in any way. I'm fascinated by what they have achieved. So my two thoughts are this. Thought number one is to say, yeah, uh, do, you have a, do you have a NASA class team where you work? Are you working on NASA class problems? Because my experience is that most people do not have that team and they are not working on that problem. And so as a result, the techniques that NASA and more recently specifically JPL used may or may not work for your particular team. It is certainly true that those people were driven by a very large and far away purpose. But if you actually look at the work that they did, one of the things you'll find is that they took a whole lot of local steps and they not only took those local steps, it's not just the good part, they also untook them. They took a step, they saw that it did not do what they wanted it to do, and they went backwards. They were oriented towards getting themselves to the moon or to Mars. But the actions they took were extremely local. And in fact, the teams that they made were actually extremely local too. So I certainly, I certainly admire the work that they did, but I don't actually think it goes against what we've talked about here. Big Bang Projects, those people celebrated every teeny tiny win, I guarantee it. I guarantee they did. In fact, they would never have been able to pull off Apollo without celebrating those individual wins. And in those days, of course, you know, the team was far smaller and much more of a small community of people who were driven and who interacted with each other every minute of every day. They did amazing things. So. Thank you. That's my answer to that one. Uh, another one. Can you give a, a specific example of a time when experiences created a profound change in people or a person? I'll use one from code. I, uh, I became a coach uh, uh, of extreme programming uh, shortly after it got that designation because we had been building the ideas around it leading up to that, that stretch of time. So before there was even such a thing as an agile movement, And even slightly before extreme programming was rigorously defined, um, I was out there as a software consultant. And one of the things I did was I I, I slid XP under the door at the shops where I was given a possibility of of doing real change and having real control over my thing. And and, um, my friend Gary, Gary, old school, hardcore, uh, software geek of the engineer type, a thinker, a theorist, a blah, 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 blah. And uh, we were controlling um, fancy airplane modems uh, uh, and radio stations, uh, controlling their configuration remotely. That was the gist of the project. And what it basically amounted to, uh, a large part of it was faking, pretending to be a typist at the console that they had installed on site, right? We hijacked that stream, we sent them characters instead of typing. So. You get a lot of ASCII scripts in one thing or another. And I decided to approach that task using test-driven development. And Gary was like, I don't know, this guy, he's obsessed with this test-driven development. He thinks it's really cool, but he's, he seems like an okay guy. He seems pretty smart. We'll let him do this thing. After about six weeks of this, we discovered a, a not actually a bug, but a problem. Um, they had changed models of one of the internal cards. So the old scripts had too many carriage, reti- uh, carriage returns and line feeds in them. And so they weren't 
syncing up correctly and it wasn't controlling the thing. Gary came to sit down with me and we looked at the code and uh, what I did was he advised it, you know, oh, I see the problem right there. We'll change that from being a carriage return line feed to being just a line feed. And I said, okay, and I changed it. And I ran the test and I don't know, out of maybe 60 or 70 tests, 30 of them broke instantly. So we took another look and the problem was that was the right change to make, <laughs> but that was not right the right place to make that change. We were covering a, a, a larger area of our scripts than we meant to. So we drilled down again. We found the right place to make that change. We broke one test, which was the test we expected to break. Then we recoded that test without making the change because we were actually, I was pretty hardcore about my TDD in those days. So now it's still red, but it's different. Now we add the change, now we get to green. So Gary and I go outside, we're both heavy smokers and Gary and I go outside for a smoke break and, He's being really quiet, really quiet. Like, and, you know, we're friends. And I'm just chattering in my head. He hasn't said a word. So finally, I, you know, I run out of steam. And, and he's staring off into space, smoking his cigarette like a chimney. He turns to me, he says, you know, I guess this TDD shit really works. He was a dyed-in-the-wall dyed test-driven development fan from that moment forward and called me back many times over the remaining years to actually uh, show him how to test something that he wanted to know about because he found that value. He got that value from one experience of a couple of hours of coding and debugging. Even though for the previous six, eight weeks, I had been chattering to him, arguing with him, constantly pushing him to accept the reality. He accepted the reality when he experienced the reality. That's my answer to that. I'm sorry, I just go on and on, don't I? Thank you. No, that was a great story. All right, we do have a, a question in Slack. How do you facilitate the conversation with straight line focused management while trying to take the small step that isn't exactly on the line? So that's a trade secret. I mean, I'm serious. Um, oh, no, I'm not serious. It's not a trade secret. Uh, I'm a professional coach. This is what I do for a living is negotiate those conversations. Um, normally, what it comes down to is pointing out to them that the last 10 times they did this, it worked once. And that one in 10 is not actually good enough. Here's what I see most often. Um, what they're really trying, you know, when you when you put together a whole bunch of teams in that parallel thing with lots of stories and you're trying to release them, what you're really solving is a packing problem, which for the computer geeks in the in the room, the hardcore, right? That that problem is NP complete. An NP complete problem uh, is usually not relevant to our concerns because the N, the the number of items that we have to solve for, is small enough that we can solve them in real time with a computer or with a human. What happens is as these problems scale though, the cost of solving them shoots up and skyrockets. Convincing them that that is why those nine things that failed out of 10 fail is some of the hardest part of the, of the work that I do. I will say this, it does not, just like what I said before, it, it does not depend on argument at all. The only way I've ever found to really convince them is to give them some sort of experience that, that communicates to them how impossible it is to solve NP-complete problems once the N goes up high. I don't use that terminology. I don't use that argument. I use practical, practical experiences. There are lots and lots of... Uh, if you go like to the Agile Games folks, they have lots and lots of different ideas for ways to get across different messages physically without turning somebody into a programming expert. I do a lot of that kind of stuff. But to be, to be honest, most of what I do is I develop relationships of trust with people. Most people start a thing because they don't think it's going to cost them very much to try it and because they trust the person who's recommending it. They don't do it because of the great arguments. They don't do it because of the thick 
reams and reams of, of reason or data. If they did, they would have abandoned those six principles a long time ago because the data is overwhelmingly against those six ideas being successful at creating large scale success. Thank you. Uh, a question, what are some good points or good stopping points to tell you when you need to reorient? Well, you know, I, I try to reorient after every single step. Because remember, in my mind, step means, I use the word shippable when we're talking about code, but, but installable when we're talking about <laughs> changing organizations, right? <clears throat> it's always a good time to reorient. Um, but of course, a good thing to do for me with a team is actually to set a period after which we will purposefully reorient no matter where we are, much like the agile technique of retrospectives are intended to help us do. So that's a viable option for doing that as well. Of course, the good news is no matter what you do, outside forces will come <laughs> into your environment and they will force you to reorient, even if you forgot to reorient the last three times you actually shipped a step. Because that is exactly the problem that we're trying to solve, is exactly that changeability problem. Thank you. Uh, and I'm not seeing any more questions in Zoom or Slack, but if yeah. anyone wants to follow up in Slack, that will remain open. Uh, thank you very much for the talk and I do like seeing old ads. So thank you for including those too. <laughs> yeah, you're very, you're very welcome. Folks, I hope you had a good time. Uh, you can find me at gpawhill.org. You can always ping me on Twitter. I'm a hardcore Twitter person at gpawhill. Uh, reach out to me if you have any further questions or comments or trash talk. I always enjoy that kind of stuff. So, uh, so again, Thank you very much. And thank you, uh, Alicia, for being such a gracious host. No problem. You're a great speaker to host. <laughs> Thanks. All right, everyone. Have a great evening. And thank you for attending ETE. Bye now. <laughs>